Welcome back everyone, my name is Robius, and today I'm proud to share with you the 12th episode in the new iteration of Assassin's Creed The Real History. We'll be picking up where we left off in the previous video by continuing the sub-series of these episodes in which I chronologically covered the time periods used as the backdrops for the various Assassin's Creed titles, filling you in on their major historical events, breaching the historical gaps left by the games, and introducing you to the individuals who actually existed. Having said that, this episode will concentrate on the Italian Renaissance, which served as the set piece for both Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood. Please be aware of story spoilers throughout the entire video. Before officially beginning this episode, I'd like to first discuss the parameters of this topic. It's important to understand that the Renaissance as a whole is considered to be a centuries-long experience in European history that bridged the gap between the cultural periods of the Middle Ages and the modern era which featured the rise of humanist beliefs and encouraged the acquisition of knowledge and free thinking. For the sake of this video, we'll be specifically concentrating on the Renaissance within Italy. Although sources differ on the exact start and end years of the Italian Renaissance, most can generally agree that it occurred somewhere within the 14th to the 16th century. Originally, I intended to solely cover the sub-period recognized as the High Renaissance, which represented an approximate 30-year stretch that encompassed much of the Assassin's Creed storyline. However, since the entire beginning of Ezio's story occurs prior to these three decades, I instead decided to provide you all with a general overview of the entire Italian Renaissance while putting an emphasis on its later years. Therefore, please keep in mind that since the Renaissance is not a set event per se, but rather a period, this video will be mainly centered on discussing its general themes, while also specifically concentrating on the events presented in the games. Now that I've clarified that, without further ado, let's discuss the history of the Italian Renaissance prior to the events of Assassin's Creed. As I stated earlier, although many historians disagree at exactly which time the Italian Renaissance began, most tend to point towards similar elements when discussing its origins and the factors which led to its occurrence. Throughout the 13th and 14th centuries, the Italian region experienced significant change. As a result of their involvement in the Crusades, certain port cities had obtained access to valuable trade routes in the Levant, greatly expanding their import of foreign products and their subsequent sale to the rest of Europe, thus providing the area as a whole with newfound wealth. These financial benefits were among the multiple elements that played a role in the rise of the Italian merchant class. As the region established itself further, in the form of consolidated city-states, this cultural and financial shift led to a steady decline in feudalism and opened the way for strong independent governments. With the rise of the Italian financial sector and the creation of international banks and foreign exchange markets, both merchants and bankers were among the most important political players within this new societal structure in which old laws were rewritten. In this period, the concept of patronage saw a brief resurgence as the wealthy began commissioning works. Unfortunately, this period of change was soon stifled. The economy was struck by recession, only worsened by the Hundred Years' War between the kingdoms of France and England, and the actions of the Ottoman Empire at the time, which negatively impacted trade profits. In addition, the Black Death also struck from the mid-1340s to early 1350s, eventually leading to the death of anywhere from one-third to nearly one-half of the European population. These significant circumstances led to further important developments within the Italian culture. A standout example of this was how the sudden decrease in available labor meant that the remaining workers were gradually paid more. Subsequently, as the economic crisis began to pass, new banking families, among which stood the Medici, rose to prominence as much of their earlier competition had now been wiped out. It's also worth mentioning the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire in 1453, which ultimately led to a mass exodus of Eastern scholars who sought refuge in Italy and brought with them elements from their traditional Greek culture. Another important component to understand was the political status of the region. Through years of infighting, the various city-states had battled for control while outside influences vied for their own piece of the region. These wars, mainly fought by mercenaries that were contracted by the city-states instead of standing armies, spanned for decades. However, by the 1450s, it became clear that Florence, Venice, Naples, and Milan represented the most significant factions. Eventually, these city-states were able to broker a peace agreement in favor of pursuing economic success instead of military expansionism. 
These non-aggression pacts led to decades of diplomatic negotiations between the city-states instead of outright war, with most agreeing to discourage the interference of external powers in their local affairs. It was within this new climate that most historians state the Italian Renaissance truly began, due to the opportunity created by these specific circumstances which allowed for the emergence of cultural changes the likes of which had not been seen for centuries. Florence specifically is considered by most to be the original birthplace of the Renaissance. With a new redistribution of wealth among a rich merchant and banking class, leading figures within the city-states set an example by demonstrating their wealth as a status symbol through patronage. It is consequently stated that the Medici family were among the most important patrons of the period. This, in turn with the city's thriving economy, quickly earned it the title of being the cultural center of Europe. The concept of patronage, which had only seen a brief resurgence prior to this revitalization, allowed artists, poets, musicians, authors, scholars, architects, and the like to commit themselves fully to their craft. The fact that these individuals were now able to work on these projects full time consequently led to a period of explosive creativity. Soon after, although Florence was its birthplace, the movement quickly spread to neighboring city-states, with their various rulers and wealthy figures embracing the concept of becoming a patron of the arts. Notably, it was under Pope Nicholas V that the church also became more involved in this patronage, going so far as to invest heavily in the renovation of Rome. Beyond simply funding the arts, this system also furthered the work of various intellectuals who explored different scientific, mathematic, and philosophical avenues. The discoveries made, the art created, the thoughts pondered, and the stories written were also distributed throughout Europe to an unprecedented degree due to the recent advent of the printing press, which finally made this type of knowledge, once a rare commodity, far more accessible. Historians point to the availability of this information as a partial cause for the return of a more classical education model, which is believed to have ended a lengthy interval of cultural stagnation. Chronologically, this would represent the point where the plotline of Assassin's Creed II would finally begin, skipping ahead from Ezio's 1459 birth and introducing the players to the Florentine noble during a brawl with his rival in 1476. At this point in time, the city was culturally thriving, with many new artists starting their careers within. Leonardo da Vinci was one such individual who just recently completed his apprenticeship and had officially begun accepting a professional commission. It was within this atmosphere that he first met Ezio in the game. Unfortunately, Assassin's Creed II's narrative soon took a darker turn, and following a series of fictional events which saw the execution of his father and brothers, his summary retaliation against the executioner, and his subsequent retreat from Florence, Ezio quickly found himself embroiled in a very real conspiratorial plot. Historically speaking, the current ruler of Florence was Lorenzo de' Medici, a member of the wealthy banking family. Following in the footsteps of his predecessors, Giovanni and Cosimo, he did much for promoting the culture of patronage in Florence, with many stating that it reached its peak in the city under his rule as he personally sponsored a variety of artists. It was through such ventures that he met and became friends with the scholar Angelo Abrogini. However, although Lorenzo had successfully maintained good relations with some of the neighboring city-states, his rapport with the papacy had rapidly gone from mediocre to abysmal. This led a group of conspirators who opposed the Medici rule of Florence and mainly consisted of bankers and members of the church operating with the technical approval of Pope Sixtus IV to organize a coup d'etat. The goal would be to kill the ruling Medici family members and replace them with Girolamo Riario, who was the nephew of the Pope, as the new Lord of Florence. This plot came to be known as the Pazzi Conspiracy as it was believed to be spearheaded by the Pazzi banking family, with Jacopo de Pazzi and Francesco de Pazzi at its head. In the game, Ezio became aware of the plot when tracking individuals he believed were involved in his family's death. Quickly piecing it together, the Florentine nobles soon realized what was going to happen and decided to try and prevent it. In actuality, on Sunday, April 26, 1478, the plot was put into effect, and in the midst of high mass, the conspirators struck. Lorenzo de' Medici was injured by his assailants, but managed to flee and hide with the help of his friend Poliziano. Unfortunately, Lorenzo's brother, Giuliano de' Medici, was stabbed to death by two of the conspirators. Ultimately, due to the disorganization of their efforts, and Lorenzo's survival, the conspiracy failed. 
In Assassin's Creed II's depiction, this was largely due to Ezio's interference, since although he was too late to save Giuliano, he successfully protected Lorenzo from being killed. Thereafter, in the game, Ezio killed Francesco de Pazzi and had his body hung, while the other conspirators fled, only to be systematically hunted down and assassinated by the young man throughout the following year. Although the aftermath of the conspiracy slightly differed in the game from the history, they did share a few notable parallels. For example, many records point to the fact that Francesco de Pazzi was in fact hung from the walls of the city hall, and that most of the other conspirators were also executed within the following years for their involvement. It's also worth mentioning that, unlike in the game, Francesco Salviati was hung alongside Francesco de Pazzi immediately after the failed coup, while Jacopo de Pazzi and many of the other conspirators were later captured, tortured, and hung in Florence at different intervals. Among the individuals who fled with Jacopo when failure was in sight were Bernardo Baroncelli, Stefano da Bagnone, and Antonio Maffei. Therefore, it would be safe to say that these remaining conspirators weren't all hunted down by a sole assassin. The game's narrative then has Ezio following in the footsteps of his friend Leonardo da Vinci by beginning his travels to Venice in hopes of tracking down more of the men involved in executing his family members. It's worth mentioning that historically, da Vinci would not actually leave for Venice until years later. Nonetheless, during his travels, Ezio briefly met and befriended Caterina Sforza, the wife of Girolamo Riario, Lord of Imola and Forli, and former Pazzi conspirator. Soon after, the protagonist reached Venice, and again uncovered another conspiracy organized by the fictional Templars. However, instead of being rooted in historical fact, this one was more tied into popular rumors of the period. In the game, during his subsequent years in Venice, Ezio discovered that the Templars initially sought to turn the Duce of Venice, the city's titular leader, to their cause, but when this failed, they instead turned to the idea of killing him and replacing the man with one of their own. This led to a series of missions, in which Ezio enlisted the help of the local thieves' guild and da Vinci, eventually succeeding in using one of the inventor's flying machines to breach the walls of the Doge's residence. In the game, Ezio arrives too late, with Doge Giovanni Mocenigo having already been poisoned, leading the assassin to instead kill the fictional Templar conspirator and flee as he himself was accused of the murder. Historically speaking, there is no record of such an assassination plot. However, it was postulated by certain sources of the period that the Dudge may have in fact been poisoned in 1485. Thereafter, Marco Barbarigo was elected as the new Dudge of Venice. Assassin's Creed II presents him as one of the Templar conspirators involved in the earlier plot, and their chosen candidate to rule Venice in accordance with the Templar agenda. This again led to another series of fictional missions, which saw Ezio coordinate with da Vinci and his allies over the following year to both build an early version of a wrist-mounted pistol and gain him access to the Venetian Carnevale celebrations where he would finally succeed in killing Marco Barbarigo. Afterwards, Ezio's allies explained that the man's brother, Agostino Barbarigo, would be replacing Marco as Venice's doge and usher in a period of legitimacy. When reviewing the actual history, it's important to note that Marco Barbarigo did die within a year of his rule as Dodge, although he was not killed during Carnevale. In fact, records differ on his exact cause of death, with some simply indicating that his passing may have been a product of infighting with other nobles. In the end, however, he was indeed replaced by his brother Agostino Barbarigo as the Dodge of Venice in 1486. The game then presents a completely invented narrative in which Ezio eliminates the remaining Barbarigo influence in Venice and manages to acquire a piece of Eden. This leads to another historical event in 1488. Within AC2, the Assassin Order decides to move this newly discovered piece of Eden to Forli, where it may be defended by their ally Caterina Sforza. Upon his arrival, Ezio is presented with a dilemma. Catarina had originally hired the brothers, Ludovico and Kecco Orsi, to kill her husband, Girolamo Riario, for being a Templar conspirator, thus giving her the technical control of his cities. However, these same Orsi brothers were then tasked by the Templar Order to take control of Forli and acquire both a codex map and the piece of Eden. During the siege, they captured two of Catarina's children, Bianca Riario and her brother, Ottaviano Riario, and tried to use them as leverage. In the end, Ezio succeeded in liberating the city, freeing the children, and killing the Orsi brothers at the cost of being severely wounded and losing the Peace of Eden. Although the event presented in the game definitely holds ties to the actual occurrence, there were multiple fictionalized components. 
Historically speaking, there is no record of Katarina hiring the Orsi to act as her assassins. In fact, most sources point to the idea that the Orsi acted of their own accord, killed Girolamo, and attempted to capture the city as a whole, in which time they took Katarina and her children as prisoners. They were unable to take the fortress within, at which point Katarina said she would negotiate the surrender on their behalf and would leave her children with them as collateral. However, once she entered the fortress, she defied them and was able to hold the Orsi off until support from her uncle arrived and Katarina was able to regain control of the city. Despite records being limited on this confrontation, many point to the fact that much of the Orsi family involved in the conspiracy then fled into exile, including the brothers. Within the game, Ezio recovers from his injuries over time and recommences his hunt for the Peace of Eden. During this time period, the game parallels the actual history by featuring the ascension of Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia to the papacy as Pope Alexander VI in 1492. According to the AC2 narrative, he was the Grand Master of the Italian Templar Order and sought this position of power to gain access to another piece of Eden and a precursor site. Nevertheless, we continued to follow Ezio in his hunt for his piece of Eden, which led him to discover that it had been acquired by the Dominican friar Girolamo Savonarola. The game had the priest use this powerful artifact to manipulate the population of Florence, having it turn against its current ruler Piero de' Medici, the son of Lorenzo, and instead recognize him as the city-state's de facto ruler in 1494. In reality, although this did occur, it was due to the distaste of the ruling Medici, the tumultuous military standoff with France, and the effectiveness of his sermons that Savonarola was actually able to take control of the city. Within this position of power, he preached about reformation, the cleansing of corruption within the church, and eventually the destruction of items which represented human sins. This led to an event known historically as the Bonfire of the Vanities, in which the people of Florence disposed of art, literature, and a large variety of other items into public bonfires meant to cleanse away their sins of vanity and their glorification of secular pieces. Although his rule of the city arguably stretched for a few years, it was finally brought to an end in 1498. The game credits the downfall to the interference of the assassins in his affairs, who eventually succeeded in turning the population against him, when in reality, Savonarola's loss of power is more so attributed to his recent excommunication by the Pope and how he failed to meet the challenges of some of his contemporaries, leading the preacher to be condemned to death. Historically, he was hanged and burned. However, AC2 has Ezio kill him before he is burned at the stake, and afterwards retrieve the piece of Eden he had lost. Notably, the friar's downfall preceded the rise of a few important political figures within Florence, among which were Niccolo Machiavelli, who at the time was beginning his more than decade-long direct involvement with the city-state's politics. It is also essential to recognize that this time period represented the opening of the Italian Wars, which were fundamentally over six decades of fighting that originally erupted over the dynastic rule of certain Italian city-states by foreign leaders, but quickly devolved into years of conflict over the control of large portions of the region. The involvement of other countries in regional politics once again prompted a large influx of mercenary armies to be employed by certain city-states, with individuals like Bartolomeo dal Viano making their mark on history during these conflicts by standing against and defeating certain armies sent by empires to conquer the cities they defended. Now as I mentioned earlier, there's a general disagreement on the exact duration of the Renaissance. Certain sources point to the rise of Savonarola and the subsequent events displayed in the Bonfire of the Vanities as its technical end. However, most tend to believe that this point in time did not represent the overall end, but rather simply the decline of Florence's role in the movement. In fact, many list the period that follows as the High Renaissance, when the movement began to take center stage in cities like Venice and Rome in the 1490s, at which point it was felt the artists had reached the pinnacle of their creation process, utilizing all the new methods and practices developed throughout the earlier years of the period. Nevertheless, back in the game, having just acquired his precursor artifact, Ezio finally faces off against and spares the life of Pope Alexander VI, discovers the fault and its message, and flees Rome as a result. This fictional sequence leads to the equally invented opening of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, in which Cesare Borgia, son of the Pope, lays siege to Monterigioni and defeats the assassins within, taking back the Peace of Eden. In response, Ezio makes his way to Rome to launch a campaign with the goal of eliminating the Borgia and the Templars while re-establishing his own order. 
Now, although the Siege of Monterigioni was entirely fictional, it was representative of the military campaigns launched by Cesare Borgia against his adversaries in Italy at the time. It's important to recognize that this opening segment of the game represented the time period in which Cesare was just launching his military career and had begun conquering neighboring regions in the name of the Papal States. Nevertheless, during his early days in Rome, Ezio came across Nicolaus Copernicus, who'd historically been working on a few astronomy-based projects in the city that year. Although the interaction where he and his contemporaries are accosted by church representatives for the content of their speeches which oppose religious teachings was fictionalized, it was symbolic of the type of pushback scientific figures would still experience during that period. Within a year of his arrival, Ezio had identified that Caterina Sforza was a prisoner in the Castel Sant'Angelo. He made a daring attempt to save her and succeeded in freeing Caterina despite the efforts of Lucrezia Borgia, who was likely in the city at that time as she was between her second and third political-based marriages organized by her father the Pope. This sequence is interesting because certain elements were accurate while others weren't. First, Caterina had been initially captured when Cesare laid siege to her fortress in Forli instead of how the game demonstrated her being captured in Monterigioni. Then, although she was finally freed from the Castel Sant'Angelo in 1501, it clearly wasn't through the efforts of the Assassin Order, but rather through the intervention of the French army as they traveled through Rome. Once his ally was secured, Ezio launched a campaign to hunt down Cesare's commanders. His first target in this endeavor was Juan de Borja el Mayor. Although his depiction as one of Cesare's generals and the de facto banker for his military campaigns was fictionalized, he was in fact one of the so-called cardinal nephews who'd been granted his position when his Borgia relative was made pontiff. The known circumstances surrounding his death are limited, other than he is thought to have died in mid-1503, which allowed the game's writers to have Ezio kill him around that time. Furthermore, the party at which he was killed in the game, stylized as a pagan orgy of sorts, was a perfect example of the type of festivities that the Borgia family were accused of hosting throughout their reign. Thereafter, Ezio set off to hunt down the fictitious French commander who served alongside Cesare, with the assassin seeking the help of his ally Bartolomeo del Viano and his wife, Pantasilea Baglioni. It's worth saying that although the couple and their allies would have been at odds with the Borgia at this time, they likely would not have been in Rome. In addition, despite there not being any French troops under the Captain General's command at the time, this was again symbolic of the current state of affairs in Italy during the period. Throughout these years, agreements and alliances were made with France by the Borgia that had them providing their support to Cesare during some of his various Italian military campaigns. Brotherhood then had Micheletto Corella as the final so-called general serving under Cesare, who, to be fair, was perhaps the most realistic individual to be demonstrated in such a position. During different intervals in the story, Micheletto is shown acting both as Cesare's military commander, leading his troops at certain points, and as Cesare's personal assassin, such as when the game had him kill Francesco Trocca. Historically speaking, although it isn't fully confirmed, there is much speculation that this man may have been killed while serving the Borgia due to his indiscretions. However, in terms of Micheletto's depiction, as is a clear theme with the Borgia family and their close associates, due to the large amount of rumors and disputed claims concerning their lives, it's best to say that his portrayal matched well with his generally accepted history. It is also worth bringing up that this represented a period of increased resistance to Borgia control in Rome. In fact, an alliance of the Orsini, Colonna, and Savelli families, led in part by the soldier Fabio Orsini, even made a brief attempt to take the city, although they were unsuccessful and were forced to flee as Cesare made his way back to defend his father's holdings. This however was only one example of how the Borgia control had begun to weaken. In the game, with the generals defeated, Cesare was left with limited power. This led to a conflict with his father the Pope, which Brotherhood depicted by having the Pontiff try to poison his son. When this failed, Cesare retaliated by killing the Pope. This entire segment was completely fiction based, although it is believed that after sharing a meal together, the two Borgia men became severely ill, with Cesare eventually recovering while Pope Alexander VI passed away. Although the circumstances differ from the game to reality, they lead to the same conclusion in which Borgia influence in Rome steeply declines following the death of their pope, and comes to an ultimate end when Cesare is later arrested by order of the new pontiff. Chronologically, after this power struggle, in the midst of Cesare's imprisonment, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood creates another fictional series of missions, in which the artist Leonardo da Vinci is kidnapped by a secret cult who requires his talents to discover the entrance to an ancient temple. 
To save his friend, Ezio works alongside the artist's assistant, Salai, using the young man's knowledge of Leonardo's recent work to help ascertain clues to his location. Then, in Brotherhood's final confrontation, Ezio met Cesare during the 1507 siege of Viana. Here they battled, at which point Ezio let Borgia fall off the wall to his death. In reality, although Cesare was involved in the conquest of Viana, he never made it into the castle and was instead killed in combat when fighting a fleeing groups of knights defending the fortress. As this battle between the Italian assassin and the Borgia noble represented the last event in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, from this point on we will discuss the history of the Renaissance following the timeline of the AC titles. It can be said that the remaining years of the High Renaissance period in Italy were filled with the creation of further artistic masterpieces and the continued development of the region. In particular, figures like Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo became emblematic symbols of this period of creativity. Venice consolidated its seaborne trade market and brought in significant profits, while the papacy, specifically under the reigns of Pope Julius II and Pope Leo X, continued to maintain Rome's position as the new heart of patronage within Italy. As a quick note, it was within this period that Martin Luther began a movement in 1517, which led to the Reformation and created a fundamental schism within the Roman Catholic Church. Unfortunately, it is agreed by many sources that the Italian Renaissance came to its end in 1527 during the reign of Pope Clement VII, following the sack of Rome, which was conducted by imperial and Spanish troops. This devastating act led to the exodus of the papacy from the city, the decline of independent rule in the war-torn Italian region, and a general ramping down to the levels of cultural development which had been experienced over the past decades. Despite this regrettable deterioration of such an important period of change, it is essential to remember that Italy was simply its birthplace, and that the movement had already spread across Europe. One need only look at the actions of certain Italian artists, like Leonardo da Vinci, who emigrated to France in 1516, to see that the Italian Renaissance was only the beginning of a Europe-wide cultural evolution. Having arguably reached the end of the Italian Renaissance, I feel that we can now move on to the video's final chapter and review everything we've learned so far and compare the game's depiction to the actual history. Before starting this analysis, given the massive size of this video, I think it's only fair to say I'll be solely concentrating on the major story elements for this review and will omit the minor details related to specific characters. Those will likely be discussed within the individual characters' videos at a later date. I'll begin by reviewing the completely fictionalized components of the games. The first of these major points was Ezio's attack on Pope Alexander VI at the end of AC2. Although there had been apparent assassination attempts on the Pope's life, there was never anything quite to the degree of a man charging him in the middle of mass only to lead to a battle between the individuals. The next one which comes to mind was the Siege of Montedigioni. This acted as the primary catalyst for Ezio's entire story in Brotherhood, and the whole battle was actually just invented for the sake of the game, with the writers taking elements from Cesare's attack of Forli, like Catarina Sforza's capture, and attributing them to this fictional battle instead. Lastly, it should go without saying, but for the sake of consistency, I'll remind you that the premise of the Templar vs. Assassin battle for the Pieces of Eden, which drove the main narrative for both of these games, was clearly 100% fictionalized. With all of these points cleared up, let's move on to the portions of the game that took inspiration from real historical events, but that the writers altered to fit the game's storylines. In chronological order, these were as follows. The first was the Pazzi Conspiracy, which was altered to be a plot organized by Rodrigo Borgia that only failed due to the interference of Ezio Auditore. Next was the succession of the Venetian Doges, which was altered by presenting a rumor as fact when they had Doge Mocenigo poisoned and replaced by Marco Barbarigo, and further change the history by having this new Doge killed by Ezio. After this was the siege in Forli, whereby the Orsi's attack on the city wasn't credited to the family's goals, but rather attributed to a Templar plot to retake a piece of Eden. As the last manipulation of the AC2 history, we saw the game credit Savonarola's rise to power in Florence to acquiring the same piece of Eden, instead of correctly representing his ascension as a product of their actual political, military, and religious circumstances. Within the scope of Brotherhood, the entire concept of Ezio hunting down Cesare's generals in the city was fictionalized, but it represented the general decline in Borgia influence over this period of time. Next, the game had Cesare kill his father, the Pope, which is an incredibly unlikely scenario, however it was among a series of potential rumors at the time for how the pontiff may have died. 
Lastly, as an overall blanket statement, the vast majority of assassination targets did die around the time depicted in the games, but all from circumstances that differed from being hunted by the same lone assassin. Keeping all of this information in mind, let's now consider whether the Italian Renaissance was fairly depicted in the Assassin's Creed games. When you realize the massive scope of this culturally transformative movement, and you accept the fact that not all of its components could be proportionally included within just two games, I personally feel as though the final product should be acknowledged as a good depiction of the time period. Throughout the approximate 30 years of Ezio's life that we get to experience in Italy as a player, I believe the game's creators were able to give us a good, passive sense of the world through his eyes. Much of the game's time is spent in cities like Florence, Venice, and Rome, where it is truly possible to take in the apparent cultural rebirth where art and education have become central components of urban society. Ezio runs into various artists and thinkers of the period at different points in their careers, with Da Vinci and Machiavelli actually providing two examples of progression as their roles develop over time. We're provided with insight on this cultural shift, but we are also made privy to its more complicated undertones, with religious backlash against the church's declining influence, the constant threat of foreign involvement in Italian affairs, and the complicated political landscape of the various city-states and their rulers. In addition, multiple sources point to the fact that although the Renaissance brought about significant cultural and ideological changes, it didn't necessarily represent a period of social or economic development for most citizens. In fact, it is believed that a large portion of the population, estimated at numbering nearly three quarters, still lived in rural environments and therefore did not experience a larger degree of these changes, a fact which was partly demonstrated in the game during the brief instances where the player travels between cities and witnesses the still underdeveloped agricultural areas. Overall, despite its alteration to the history for the sake of storytelling, I still greatly enjoyed the depiction of the Italian Renaissance in the Assassin's Creed games and felt it was a wonderful nod to a very influential historical period. With that final thought, we have reached the end of today's video. If you enjoyed the content, please share this series with your friends and be sure to check out the other episodes. Although I intend to continue the trend of covering all the time periods, please feel free to leave me your topic request for future videos in the comments. My sources for making this video can be found in the description bar below. Thanks for watching.